not joe walker walker how are you (laughs) i'm great mark how are you good good for anyone watching or anyone uh, listening obviously we do not have joe this week joe is (laughs) off exploring the eternal city of rome and i am sitting here just a big pile of jealousy uh wishing that i could be there so but good for joe he definitely deserves the break uh he works really hard i will never say this publicly with him on the podcast but i will say it here and trust that he's not going to listen to it um so his head doesn't get too big but i do have somebody here uh walker diable right diable uh, diable diable i've been pronouncing it diable for a while and walker and i know each other from a past transaction uh he bought uh, a listing from uh me a, a business from me a few years ago uh but walker is also going to be joining the quiet light brokerage team here in about a month um maybe less by the time that this episode airs uh and uh, so he is somebody to get to know as well from that regard and we're going to have a good conversation today mainly because your background uh, walker is super extensive like a lot of the people that that work with quiet light brokerage you have that direct experience in buying building uh your own Uh, online businesses. So let's do this. Let's go back and have you introduce yourself a little bit and and a little bit of your background. Sure. Gosh, where to start? Um, I I guess I I think um, uh, I have, I've started a few companies and um, all of them uh, tend not to do very well. And that's not something that I'm prideful about, but I think that it's, it's a common theme that you hear from entrepreneurs, which is, you know, fail, fail often. I've, I've done that plenty, right? And statistically, that's what startups do. Um, Conversely, I've had tremendous success in actually buying existing companies and growing them. And over the past 10 years, I've been able to acquire um, uh, seven companies in all, Uh, some of them offline, some of them online, as you've discussed. And I I just want to take one moment and say that having looked at hundreds of, of, of uh, offering memorandums, I became a very early fan of Quiet Light Brokerage. I just think that um, what you've been able to build at Quiet Light is uh, very special. Um, you you work with sellers, you list them at the right time, and you think about it in the same way that buyers would. So whenever I look at a listing from Quiet Light, I'm just absolutely thrilled with the package and um, uh, excited to be on with you now because of that. And if anyone's wondering, I do pay by the compliment. So um, <laughs> I'm going to a big fat check here. Uh, yeah, so you, your background is in in buying. You, you bought a number of companies. You said, how many was it? Ten? Seven. I bought seven, seven. over 10 years. Yeah. Okay. Over 10 years. So I, I, I thought it was seven. And not everything has been online. Uh, you own a couple of different offline businesses as well. Uh, right. And your background before that was publishing, right? It was printing. So yeah, we, I, my, first, um, my first company I bought pretty much because uh, when I was in graduate school, when I was getting my MBA, our startup failed. It, 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 um, if you ever saw a movie called Avatar, it came out with the real 3D and we had that real 3D technology and point of purchase advertising and um, had a great team and, and had some real interest and, and uh, it all just kind of got hung up in legal. I guess, you know, the people who own the technology decided that they would rather build Avatar and instead of work with us. After that startup kind of washed up and, and um, uh, I actually went and bought a book printing company. And it was a time when print is dead was a common headline. You know, Amazon was sort of moving in, the, the Kindle was coming out, the iPad was coming out, and bookstores were going out of business left and right. And what I saw, Mark, was opportunity. It was one of these things where the industry was fragmented, um, there was, you know, a lot of players, a lot of, uh, let's just say legacy teams doing the wrong things in the industry at that time. Mm-hmm. So I bought a book printing company. Um, all of our customers were, were publishers and you know, they were, they too were fighting the same things that we were seeing. And so although the offset book printing industry was declining, the digital book printing industry was climbing at a rate of about 28 
pretty clear. It was pretty clear what needed to happen. But um, yeah, trying to get that business online and produce those, you know, short run digital um, uh, products for authors and companies trying to manage their, uh, uh, their inventory levels was, was the challenge ahead. Awesome. Uh, so lots of experience there. And then you also have a little bit of experience in uh, movie making and document, uh, documentary uh, production, right. right? That's right. Yeah. Um, I consider that more of a hobby than a profession. But um, yeah, we, I've, probably, I've probably been involved with um, about 10 films over the last five years. Um, uh, most of them uh, were lucky enough to premiere at you know, Sundance, South By, um, you know, Toronto, some of the biggest festivals out there. Um, print the legend was, uh, we thought it was going to be the first Netflix original. It turned out to be the second. Um, and then we just released, uh, uh, Bill Nye science guy as a, as a documentary. That that's you. That's yeah. I was involved. Oh, that's right. You told me about that. I forgot about that. I've seen that <laughs> pop up on uh, Netflix, right? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Oh, that, that, that's fantastic. Uh, but, and you know that I can't let this uh, go, but, uh, you are IMDB listed and uh, I always joke about how you uh, are just three handshakes away from Kevin Bacon. So, uh, <laughs> you know, as you come on board with the Quiet Light team and uh, head out to conferences, if people want to meet you, you could be fourth in line to Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's that, and then uh, there's also a couple movies that you're in. Which, if anybody wants to have a, a good time, go ahead and read the reviews. That you know, that right there is a great example of why you should buy instead of build from scratch. Okay, <laughs> in other words, when I get involved with with um, uh, uh, movie production, I look for you know teams that are already assembled that really have all the variables that are critical to success. Right, and what we did early on was basically pull together a bunch of people who wanted to be filmmakers, very analogous to people who want to be running a successful company. And what came out was, um, let's just say that we, 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 got a, we got an exit, we, got a, we sold the film, but it was pennies on the dollar in terms of the budget. And um, all you need to do is read the reviews to figure out you know, the outcome of, of that recipe. Uh, so a lot <laughs> of what I do is look for teams with, with you know, directors who have the, you know, the, their, they've got the right resume to elevate to the next level. Someone on the team usually has an Academy Award. And, you know, I, I, I come in and pull some money together either, either from myself or from other people and um, help finance the, the whole thing. So it's, it's, it's very similar to, to business acquisition. So a lot of times we link to resources in the show notes. I will spare you linking to the IMDb movie reviews and have listeners look that up. And if they really want to read it, they can read it and do the work. Um, all right, let's, let's actually Thank get you. into the topic, though. Uh, let's do it. Uh, buying versus building because this is an ongoing discussion Mm. obviously everybody uh, who has bought from us in the past understands the value of buying a business but Mm. i think there's often a question in a buyer's head especially when they're looking at an opportunity so they come across a business that we have for sale and they see it and they're like this wouldn't be that hard to build uh, versus versus buying it so i want to explore that a a little bit uh, and go into your experience on both because you've had startups, you've had startups that have failed and mm-hmm. you're also uh, been successful with buying some businesses as well. What are some of the key benefits uh, of, of both in your opinion and what are some of the drawbacks of both and why at the end of the day, and this is a big question, so mm-hmm. uh, I'm going to just log off and let you talk for the next half hour. Mm-hmm. Um, why at the end of the day does, does buying in your opinion win out over building? Okay, great. So, um, Okay, let's start just by saying that, in my opinion, not every business should be bought, right? And I, I don't mean that to say like, like the businesses aren't sellable. What I mean is, is the opposite. If you've got an idea that you want to start up, um, I think that most times it makes sense to buy an existing infrastructure and go from there as opposed to starting from scratch. But there are some ideas out there that absolutely that's not the path, Okay. And so, you know, if you have an idea that's right at the beginning of an adolescent market, you shouldn't be buying, right? You need to go get VC capital and go and have a very clear understanding that, that you know, 75% of VC-backed startups actually fail, okay? So it's still not, you know, you might be getting $40 million, but, the, but uh, Jason Yellowitz, I think, was, was a perfect example of that. Didn't that happen with him? It did, yeah, yeah. So, so anyone that wants to read his book, Bathroom uh, Millionaire, he talks about how right. he had, he was worth lots of money on paper and it disappeared. Right, 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 right. And so that's actually more common than the opposite, which is, you know, the Uber and Facebook story that we all love. Um, okay, so one, let me get that 
that buying businesses in most cases is a better avenue to start. Now, let me just give you a quick example. Um, we had a company that uh, we, we fully funded, okay? We had a, um, uh, the majority investor was a former CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And um, we had a proven dev team that was already building uh, uh, mobile software for the military and special forces, proven, proven, proven. We had, we had, it was a, it was a SharePoint, a mobile SharePoint application. We had recruited and secured the head of Microsoft SharePoint services as our CEO. We had the CTO of another fortune 500 company working with us. We went through one of the top 10 accelerator programs in the country. Um, we had beta programs at big corporations, right? Like all the hallmarks of like, this is going to work. And less than 12 months later, we were out of cash. We had no paying customers. Uh, and it, it basically, we, we were able to, to sell it for, again, pennies on the dollar to a company that I think is going to do really well with it. Uh, but it's a perfect example of when everything's right, you still got to get that product market fit before the time runs out. Okay. After that, I had worked with a, um, a broker um, uh, about who lives about three and a half hours away from me. And he called and said, Hey, how's that startup going? And I said, actually, it's a little rocky. And he said, good, because I've got such a great uh, business out here that I really want you to come take a look at. And I went out there and I looked at it. And um, it, long story short, I ended up working with a, with a partner on this project. And we looked at it and what we saw was a true opportunity to take the customer base and basically upgrade the entire experience to an online ordering system, okay? And so I bought the company. We used the cash flow of the business to create a proprietary e-commerce storefront. And we then rolled it out to almost 20,000 users, okay? So the company is doing, from, you know, from the minute we walk in the door, it's doing you know, seven figures in revenue, which by the way, according to Vern Harnish at Scale Up, is 4% of companies in the United States, right? Are, are selling seven figures in revenue. So you already, you're walking in the door into one of the most successful companies in the United States, all right? Um, funding does not take 24 months and running around and you know, selling stock. You go to the bank, right? It, they finance uh, the majority of, of the purchase and you come in with, with your own investment and go to work. Everything that we achieved by buying this company in you know, sort of a second tier market in Missouri was, was everything that we were trying to do at this well-funded startup with an all-star cast, right? So it's just a perfect example of sometimes you just need to think differently about achieve, what it is you're trying to achieve and take the shortcuts to get there. Isn't that what entrepreneurship is all about? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, I, I love what you said about uh, the offline businesses. Ryan Tansom and I did a podcast episode several weeks ago and he talked about that. He talked about uh, somebody that he knows locally. I think they were doing air conditioning. Mm -hmm. And um, they aren't really bringing it online, but what they are doing is they're using online. Uh, they are using the SEO tactics and SEM tactics that you would usually apply to an online business, and he's applying it locally. So he actually bought this air conditioning repair company mm -hmm. with the idea that they were just going to absolutely crush it online. Uh, and they're doing super, super well. I think there's a ton of opportunities for buyers in that space. Can, can I can I jump in right here? Yeah, like, please. So, so one of the, one of the things that I do, I've got kind of a model that I I've, I've put together to help people find the right business for them, right? And what you just said is a perfect example of that because the first question I get is, you know, do I do I have the right what it takes, right? Do I have the right attitude to actually be an entrepreneur? I don't think that the listeners of this podcast need that, right? I mean, that's that's not where they are. The next one is, what are your strengths and weaknesses, right? What are the actions that you want to be doing every single day? And it sounds like this is an individual who says, look, I know online marketing. I know how to apply it. And you look at the, the vast number of companies that are coming online to sell. And they're actually not online businesses at all, right? You've got all the baby boomers retiring at like 9,000 a day. And they own more companies than any generation ever in history. And they've, you know, they haven't done much since the internet came out, right? So internet marketing as clearly past, you know, the, the, the point of adoption. I mean, it's, it's the way now, but not everyone is caught up and you've got a huge amount of opportunity to do exactly this, move in, buy an offline business 
and basically apply online skills to grow it in a whole new way. Let's talk a little bit about this because I know that you are in the process of writing a book on buying businesses. What, what's the book about specifically? Yeah, basically everything we've been talking about, it's called Buy Then Build, Why Entrepreneurs Should Buy Existing Companies Rather Than Starting From Scratch. Um, and it's really everything that we've, we've just been talking about, right? So, so um, uh, the argument is that, you know, not only is buying businesses a better way to start, despite the popularity of entrepreneurship, we haven't engineered a better way to make startups succeed, Right. And I think that the answer to that question is to buy existing companies with existing cash flow. And if you look at buying a small business compared to just as an investment, pretend you're not an entrepreneur that's going to move in and use your skill set to grow it. Not going to move in and buy it like a real estate investment or anything else. The returns that you can generate on something like that, the ROI is not really comparable to anything that I've seen, right? especially if you want to maximize the ROI and use a lot of leverage, that opportunity is there. I mean, the SBA is lending, I don't want to overspeak because I'm not sure in online businesses without, you know, but, but um, you can put as little as 10% down in these kind of instances, right? So, I mean, you can be up and running and off to the races very, very quick. Are you seeing that in online businesses as well, Mark? Seen what specifically? Like like a, a ninety percent leverage on some of these deals. It, currently, yes. I mean, historically, that's higher than what we've yeah. seen in the past, and that's a rule change as of two thousand eighteen. So okay. in the past, it was eighty percent though, which is still yeah eighty, you know, 80 to seventy five percent, which is still crazy amounts of leverage. Right, right, right. And I, I, look, I I, I want to be you know, 90% leverage. What I am saying is that if they choose to do that and if it succeeds, they're going to have a great ROI. <laughs> right. it's pretty much uncomparable to anywhere else, right? Uh, but there's, there's obviously inherent risk in doing something like that. So just understanding the model and being careful. However, the odds of success are ridiculous compared to, you know, a startup of, of the same caliber. So your book is called uh, Buy Then Build, which uh, you know often we think about build then sell, uh, obviously. Um, but obviously, a big part of what you're talking about here is also that act of building on top. And I think an area where a lot of buyers, especially first-time buyers, struggle is identifying how do I build on this? You know, what do I look for? And so when I talk to buyers, especially first-time buyers, and they're looking to get into this for the first time, they they start thinking about um, well, I want something that already has a history of growth. Uh, or maybe they're looking at the opposite side. I want something that has a history of not, not declining, you know, because I don't want to lose uh, on the business. Um, how should, in your opinion, and maybe you specifically, how have you attacked that, that build portion of the equation? You've obviously bought and I know with the, the one business you were talking about, you saw a way to be able to lift the entire customer experience up. Um, what are different ways that, that you think buyers can look at building after they buy? Yeah, so, so I, I've been calling this acquisition entrepreneurship, right? I mean, it, it seems to make sense. And so basically, I think that there's, there's four models of building value in a company after you buy it. Some people will say, I mean, they'll, Mark, they will very quickly jump to exactly the opposite and say like, oh, no, I want a company that's a complete disaster, right? Like I want something that I can go in and put in, you know, lean operations and fix it up because then I can like, you know, buy it cheap, create immediate value by improving all of the internal systems and then, you know, exit or run it or whatever. So that's the sort of like turnaround kind of mentality. Okay. And those are great in my opinion, if you know what you're doing, right? I mean, if you already are operational, great at operational excellence, that's going to be something that's, that's good. Others will look at, um, you know, you get these sort of like, like there are these two models. The guys over at Harvard wrote a book on how to buy a business and they buy what, what, what I, I believe they call eternally profitable businesses. This is a bad example here, but, but it's one that I always think of, which is I always think of like snow plows or something like that. Like something where, you know, there's no obvious technological innovation that's going to get rid of the need for snow plows. Right. And so, um, it's going to be a slow growth, but, but, you know, something you can hang your hat on. And I think that the way that they grow, they build value is really for the owner in that instance, and just through equity buildup, right? And so you're, 
you're, you're putting, you know, say 10% down and then, and then over 10 years building up the rest of that, of, of that value um, that way. You know, the other model, which, which I'm getting to the point, sorry, but, but the other model that scares me a little bit is you look at these high growth companies, like the ones you're talking about. And, you know, what, built, what, what maximizes a sale price are things like growth, revenue, earnings, right? I mean, these are the things that, 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 you know, that people want, right? I mean, this is a very marketable company. But by doing that, it's almost the opposite of the turnaround. The risk is a little separate. Like it needs to continue growing as fast in order to make sure you're getting the right deal. So that's something that, in my opinion, you have to know what you're doing to navigate that properly. Then you've got this sort of uh, platform company. Yeah, and, and a platform is something where you take your skill set and apply it to the existing business in order to, to take it to the next level. Now, it might be accelerating what's already happening, or it could be simply diversifying. So in other words, the first online business, um, so I bought a company from Quiet Light Brokerage, right? And when I looked at it, I really liked it because it was taking this sort of like old economy product and it had a kind of innovative uh, twist to it, right? And so it was, it was still unknown in the US market. And so as that awareness grows, the company continues to grow. However, what I acquired in this business was not only the cash flow, it was the infrastructure. It was all the people, right? I had an entire customer service team. Um, I, had a, I had a reliable PPC guy. I had, you know, SEO, you know, I've got, now I've got all the tools and all the things that I need to do this. And so what I've done is, is I've started building other sites as well. And so I'm not quite to the point where I've built a seven figure site from scratch that you can list for me, but I'm hoping to do that. And I'm doing it with the actual, the actual infrastructure that I acquired through QuietLight. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, of course, you'll be able to sell that business on your own uh, when that day comes, right? Uh, because you'll be working with us and you'll just put it up for sale and everyone will be like, oh, this is great. Walker owns this. Uh, I trust it completely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, what you've done though recently uh, in anticipation of coming on board, I know that you have been working your way out of your companies as an operator and really working as an investor. And I know this, you know, talking to buyers, uh, one of our most popular episodes was with uh, Shaquille Prasla, who has bought eight companies in two years. And uh, he does this all the time, right? He, he does not work in his businesses. Um, what was that process like for you? Or what's it been like to get yourself out of the operations of the business? And how did you go about doing that? Yeah, it was more... Um it was kind of a slow evolution, right? Like, like in other words, the, the first company that, that I bought, I had a key man, woman actually, that I worked alongside with very closely. And she did a lot of the, um, all of my time was spent on marketing, sales, and really strategy, like taking the company to the next level, right? And um, you can do a lot more. Uh, what do they say? Work on your business instead of in your business. Mm -hmm. And so I fell in love very quickly with the freedom that comes with having, you know, uh, other people you can rely on in your company. As a result, um, as I continue to move forward, I always look for business opportunities and, and people that I know whose skill set matches up with the growth opportunity for that business. Right. And so um, the second company I bought, it was more of a partnership. And I learned the hard way that, um, how do I say this without being, I was messing the company up, okay? It's one of these where he had his hands on everything that was going on. Uh, I would show up, uh, you know, I would drop in, I was there about a day a week. Um, I had relationships with major customers and I'd walk in and just kind of, I'd see something that I thought was wrong and I would fix it or give instruction or whatever else. No matter how minor it was, it was still the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. The employees didn't know who was in charge, right? And so it was one of these like, you know, I've got to remove him or remove me kind of situations. And mm -hmm. so I've tried to put the emphasis where the skill is. And um, the other thing that comes out of that is by not operating in the business, you can actually scale the number of businesses that you own, right? And that's that's what your, your other guest was doing, if I recall correctly. He was actually uh, uh, interviewing and hiring managers, right? I typically do it with people that I know already. So it's not, you know, I network and find the people and then I wait for the opportunity as opposed to um, kind of trying to scale up that rapidly. Um, it got to the point where 
the third business I acquired, I was buying specifically because I had the manager to grow it. And, you know, it's working now because that's at a point where I think last year we grew uh, 38% year over year. So that's working. Right. Um, and I think the hard decision comes for entrepreneurs at every step of growth where they say, okay, I'm the one doing this. And if I actually pay someone to do that, then I make less money. So I'm not sure I want to do it. Right. But then the second they hire it out, they have all this other money or, you know, whatever the difference is that's coming to them for essentially doing nothing or essentially moving to that four hour work week model. Mm -hmm. But if you have a four hour work week kind of company, you can go buy 10 companies. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, ideally, how do you get over the ego part though? You know, for, for example, I am, in my opinion, the best content marketer in the world. Okay? You are. You are. I'm not. I mean, this is the, the, the reality. But when I'm dealing one-on-one -on -one with people, when I'm dealing one-on-one -on -one with somebody who I've hired to do that, I, I micromanage. I get too involved in, in uh, what they're doing. How do you get the ego portion out of that so that when you go and visit, do you visit that company uh, anymore? Do you uh, do? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. No, I'm, I'm very involved in, in everything. I, I think that, um, well, I, sh I should speak carefully there. What, what I'm trying to say is, is I'm not involved in the day-to-day. I, the, the truth is I'm probably more of like a chairman, but I don't have enough gray hair, so I don't call myself that. <laughs> <laughs> I have a baby face. So, um, but, but it's, you know, I work more on a strategic level and looking at metrics and talking to the managers, you know, every, every week. Um, if not, if, if not more often, if something comes up. I, so the ego, I think Mark, what I would say to that is there's certain things that, okay, it's twofold there's certain things that you're not going to be able to let go of and you feel like they have to be a very, very precise thing. Those are not the things that you want to let go of, especially to use your example, like content marketing, content marketing is something that makes quite light exceptional. It's something, you know, quite like both stands in with the best of the best, but then they stand out by doing exceptional work. And that content marketing piece is so critical to what makes quiet light, quiet light, that that might be a driver that can't be outsourced, right? It's something that has to be precise. It's something that has to come from your mind or, or your advisors' minds. And um, that piece might not be there. That said, here's the answer to your question. You're not gonna like it. I don't have a good answer for this, but here's the thing. I have three children. There's seven, five, and three, and they make mistakes. They made the same mistakes that I made when I was seven, five, and three. And you have to stand there and watch them do it, okay? And Often with my managers, one in particular, mistake, and then I'll realize that it worked. It just wasn't the way that I was going to do it. It's not a mistake at all. <laughs> <laughs> or it's the other way, and you've just got to end up paying for that mistake, right? And so it's, it's just a, you've got to get that balance right. Partnerships are, 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 I don't have a good answer for it. Partnerships are like marriages and you just have to figure out how you work and how you communicate. And, you know, if there's something that you fear isn't going to work because it's, it's, it's not being rolled out the way you want to do it. I think that what I do is I just make that clear at the beginning and then we put metrics in place to make sure to, to watch it and measure it and then kill it. If it, you know, fail quick, right? Mm -hmm. if there's anything I've learned. It's if you're going to fail, do it really quickly because you save money. <laughs> right. So I think that's the way to do it. Right. Fire quickly, hire slowly. That's right. Uh, yeah, Chuck uh, recently was talking to me about that. So, um, and the need to be able to do that. Um, awesome. We've we've covered a lot of ground uh, in this, uh, and I, I really like this discussion of should you buy, should you build. Uh, you know what's better, and I think you're right. Absolutely, a lot depends on the type of company that you do have, right? And what are you trying to, to build? Some companies do not lend themselves to being bought. Um, or to, to go in that route. Um, but if you're looking for that cash flow, if you're looking to get into entrepreneurship, uh, a faster way to a return on investment is going to be that buying uh, route. Um, it's, it's a lot faster and a lot more sure than the VC route. I, I think I was talking to a, a VC, uh, this was four or five years ago now, and he was really coming around to this idea of buying online businesses. And one thing that he told me, he said, you know, with my angel investing, with the VC investing that I'm doing, Everything is about hitting the home run. It's like, and with that, we're hit, we're striking out a lot. You know, we're yeah. 
We're taking big swings. We're not hitting the home run. But when we do hit the home run, it's really, really good. He said, but I'm starting to wonder now, maybe if we should just aim to hit some singles and some doubles and some triples instead and mm-hmm. just play station to station. And I think that's a, that's a huge difference here. Like if you have the money to be able to go in there and swing for the fences and go for it, sure, okay, you know what, go, go ahead. If you have the time, the resources, the desire, or an idea that you think really can take off, absolutely. If you're looking to hit a single or a double, you know, that it's your risk profile. What does that risk profile look like? And buying for as risky as buying an online business can be, and people should be aware of that, uh, it's certainly a lot more safer than trying to, to build something from scratch. So, so in an early, in an early version of my book, and I think I just cut it out, actually, it's, we're trying to get it done this summer, but I actually called it Entremetrics, which is stop swinging for the fences and just get on base based on saber metrics, right? You know, uh, money ball, right? And, yeah. and um, that, that resonates with me completely. That's exactly the point. I think that, you know, VC, again, I think it was Harvard Business Review released that it's 75% of these companies are like going to zero, Right. So being able to fast forward, you asked earlier, Hey, I've got, I'm a potential buyer. I'm looking at this company. I can build this. Like, this isn't that hard. Fine. Go build it. But like <laughs> looking at it as an investor, you've got that cash flow tomorrow, right? I mean, it's, it, you know, and what's your time worth and what's the, you know, what's it going to cost to build? And you've got to put all those pieces together and yeah, go build it and then bring it back to quiet light and we'll sell it because this, these are good investments, right? So yeah, yeah I think it's just, it's a simple way to, get to the the goal faster and to your point you're getting on base you're engineering success right from the beginning so that you can move to second base on your own yeah awesome so your book is coming out sometime this summer maybe maybe in the hoping, early fall. hoping for uh late late august late august all right and uh, at that point you will hopefully be a part of our team fully and um, we will be able to promote so. the book so when we do you know pay attention to that i'm sure it's going to be just one step above that harvard business review uh book <laughs> up my, which i actually have that up on my shelf they sent that uh, sent me a copy um and uh, and good stuff uh, seriously good stuff though and and uh Right now, eventually, people will be able to reach out to Walker at a Quiet Light Brokerage email address. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to reach out to Walker, contact me, Mark at Quiet Light Brokerage, and I'll put you in contact with him. Uh, he's got a ton of real-world experience, um, and both in, as you said, some failures, but a lot of successes as well, uh, and um, always a good person to talk to. Uh, any, any final parting thoughts? You know, there was one thing, forgive me, but, but there was one thing that I thought we would talk about and it just didn't come up and that's normal. But I, I spent two and a half years trying to buy an, an acquisition target when I was at Corley. And we looked at 27 companies in depth talking with them. And what I learned along that path is that there are good buyers and there are bad buyers, right? And I just mean that from the perspective of the seller. And when you're trying to sell a business, how do I say this? The buyers, it's almost like the first thing you want to do when you're just starting out is you want the seller to like come in with a slide deck, like a startup and pitch you, right? Like, here's what you're going to get. And here's why you should buy my company. And that's just not the mentality at all. Okay. Like this is someone who's built something and, and you know, it's usually like a, yeah, the timing's right. I'm considering it, but it's not like I'm trying to sell you something you don't need. And so, um, you know, trying to go, I try to go out of my way to understand the business, understand the drivers and really communicate to the seller why I would be the right buyer for that business. Because trying to get that emotional connection established at the beginning is so critically important because it's the process of buying. It's very emotional and everyone starts second guessing everything they're doing at one point or another and you know, trying to build that bond at the beginning and getting on the same side of the table to acquire a common goal is just critical in the whole process. So that was something that I, I did learn that we didn't talk about I want to share. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I've used you as an example in uh, countless uh, presentations, I think on this podcast as well. Uh, if any of you have heard me use this example before about a buyer who uh, after we submitted an LOI, you, you submitted the LOI and we had our very first call in due diligence and you stopped. And you, at the very end, you said, I want to take a moment and thank you for agreeing to sell me your business. And I, I tell this story because it, was, it, it had a seismic shift on uh, the, the way that entire transaction went. 
you know, it, it, it established this common working goal and understanding that, that I think a broker definitely needs to have. I think a buyer should have as well. The, the seller has worked for years to build something valuable, something that you want to acquire and, and take in. Showing some basic appreciation for that. And yes, they're getting well compensated through money. There's appreciation in that as well. But showing that verbal communication of, hey, I, re I really appreciate and respect what you've done uh, up till now, even if it's a distress sale, uh, boy, that makes a big difference at the end of the day. And it really helps get through some of the tough spots that will come up uh, during due diligence. And they have a choice. As a seller, they have a choice, especially at Quiet Light. Uh, Quiet Light moves a lot of inventory really fast. And I think we ended up closing on the third deal I looked at. And so there was a couple of deals that, you know, went to other sellers and I, I just didn't went out for whatever reason. And uh, they've got a choice. I agree. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. Walker, thanks so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. No, thank you, Mark. I did, looking, I'm really looking forward to the next chapter. Well, we're, we're looking forward to having you on. So uh, again, if anyone wants to reach out to Walker, feel free to contact me, mark at quietlightbrokerage.com. If you guys have ideas for guests, please let me know. I'm always looking for new guests. So we'll talk to you next week.